But we have a special guest, and that is my dad. And we've had my dad on the show before. And he is a veteran, and he's an author, and he's a writer, teacher. Uh, he's uh, he's an amazing guy. And he served our country uh, in a many different ways. And uh, one of them was to help educate my ass so that I could be here and do this. He's very thankful for that. But we're going to talk about his latest book, which is Sterling Plantation. Um, and he's got some interesting perspectives. He grew up at a time uh, when he watched uh, from the 40s, 50s, 60s. He saw the United States kind of transform through civil rights and maybe not so much. So um, uh, please welcome my dad. <laughs> and then, so we've talked about other books. We've talked about other stuff. This one's very different. You've written um, a, lot of, a lot of books, but this is the first is a historical fiction really talking about something pretty heavy. Why, why did you write this? Why now? Oh, good question. Uh, I find too many people are totally ignorant about slavery and about the civil rights movement and uh, about a lot of things in history. They just get it wrong. And so I decided to do some research, which is I don't usually do research. This is my sixth book. Uh, and It's totally historical fiction. Uh, it was a lot of fun to do because I learned a lot going back and uh, checking on sources and, and things. And uh, I just, I really wanted to be able to make a statement as a white Southerner, uh, as to what I thought about uh, plantation life and what's going on today, which is uh, the rising of uh, white supremacist uh, movement, which is really ugly. Um, and I was especially concerned when our president last year in, uh, in Charlottesville uh, felt like the Ku Klux Klan and and anyone against them should have equal voice. Uh, it was the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, which which is pretty general. You know, you would think that's what you get from this guy anyway. But I wanted to write about history uh, of a, a couple of two families that lived together in the manor house of the of the plantation. And this part has been ignored uh, in history, that when you grow up and live with people, you, you come to know them. And when you know them, it's kind of hard to hate them. Um, so there were, there were instances, and especially in what I've created in this book, uh, a story of two families, a black and a white family. And they grow up uh, to know each other and become friends. Uh, some people say this is impossible, but it's quite, it's quite probable. And in fact, it mirrors how I grew up in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, I had a colored woman, that was a term we used back in the 40s, uh, who was my daycare provider. And I did not hate her just because she was black. She took care of me. She was my, my daycare, my nanny. And so I, just, I decided to ask the question, what would happen if I had grown up in a manor house on a plantation? Hmm. Um, what would be my relationships with black people? Since the black woman in the story is the cook and housekeeper, and in many cases, those people were the uh, random nursery in the manor house. And the nursery included white and black children. So those children grew up. Now, what kind of message would they get from the, the cook who is a black person? In my case, in this story, that person it, it advises and mentors a, a white boy into loving black people. Um, so it's a different story, but it's something that really is, is, gets to the premise of the book. And that is, you can't hate somebody you know. No. Unfortunately, there's, there's still a lot of people in the South and in this country, it's not just the South, who think that it's okay to hate people. Uh, racial prejudice is rising as, along with white supremacy. And by the way, white supremacy, they love the Confederacy. They just think that's great to put up a flag with the South, the battle flag. And uh, I think it's, we're overdue to get rid of that thinking. Those people actually are domestic terrorists. They're not 
loyal to the United States. They're loyal to only to themselves. So I went off on a tangent here. <laughs> you sure did. That's all right. You took it political. I was going to go there, but that's all right. Yeah. Well, it's, okay. No, it, it, so, it, no, it is. It kind of is. Uh, so, so you've told us why you decided to write this, this book now. Talk a little bit more about your personal experiences and how you uh, integrated them into the book. Well, it's now that I've told you that I was raised primarily from zero to six years by a black woman. You can understand that uh, when I put that into a book, I'm I'm basing a lot of my feelings on my actual experiences. Uh, I saw white people treat my my Tessie Crockett. I'll just say hey, that was her name. The book is dedicated to her. I saw white people be mean to her, call her dirty names, a name that I will not use, not at all. It's uh, the N word. Uh, I saw that. And I saw how much it hurt her. And so I wanted to create a, uh, a loving relationship in a southern plantation. And uh, Tessie had stayed with me well, until I went off to college. I was 18, and they, they still had her around, even though I was a teenager and, and off a lot. But um, I think she, her cooking is what kept my father, had my father keep her there. So... I knew her for 18 years, uh, and when I graduated college, I came back and my mother said, well, we've got to go see Tessie, because Tessie thinks you're as much hers as I think you're mine, which was an amazing statement, because my mother was raised in, in a very conservative part of Virginia, uh, family Southern Baptist, but she accepted the fact that Tessie wanted part of me and would never let that go. And so I'll, I'll never remember going back and meeting her at, and it was age uh, probably 22 at the time. And it was a good relationship. That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, you've told me a lot about this growing up. Um, you, you told me a lot of different stories and, and uh, uh, I think you had a unique situation. You've also talked about um, your, your mom and dad and, and possible differences there. I want to get more into that, but I forgot to introduce or bring in Marcus, uh, who is gone now, and Laura. So I guess I'll wait for Marcus to come back before I bring everybody <laughs> in. But uh, I know there's already some questions I see right away, and I just want to know, Laura, do we want to take a moment to address these questions? Well, I think uh, Alpha was just asked, um, as, he's, as he just came in as a Southerner that was around during civil rights, how does it make you feel to know that secessionists and racists like Matthew Heimbach are gaining traction? How did it make, uh, you know, I missed the last part of that. The, who was that you said? Matthew Heimbach. Uh, how do you feel about just generally secessionists and racists getting more power these days, having been through what you've been through? I think it's criminal. It's criminal. Uh, as I, I've mentioned before, they're domestic terrorists. Uh, they hate people. And it's not just black people. It's Jews, Catholics, anyone who's a little bit other. And of course, Muslims. They have their own brand of Christianity. That's not really Christianity. Uh, it's an ideology, a political ideology that suits their purpose doesn't include many people. No. Uh, so, you know, you can't, you can't uh, forbid it. Constitution allows them to do this, but it's just amazing to me that we haven't labeled them correctly. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and thank you for the question. I want to take it from there. That's a, it's a good way to lead off on this. And that is, and hi, Marcus, by the way. Hi, Marcus, everybody. There's Marcus <laughs> and, and Laura to show everybody on the screen there. We got everybody in the four shot there. So thanks. Uh, oh, hi, you guys. There you go. Good morning, everyone. We, we will talk more about other uh, other things going on uh, with Progressive Week after the interview with, with Dad here. Um, but this is this is important because it's timely. It's heavy stuff. Um, do you you know we we I, since you and I and everybody here the people we're talking about how we need to call out these groups. Who's not calling out these groups? It's not just President Trump. I mean, we've got Congress that doesn't seem to be doing much either. Correct. And I'm asking you, Dad. I mean, um, what what do you see? You watch the news. You're yeah. you're you're from your perspective. Who's not acting? Who should be calling out these hate groups? Churches, 
number one. The churches didn't do that in the in the 19th century and in the 20th century. They were mum. This is one of uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s major complaints <clears throat> that he expected Christian churches to be for civil rights, and they weren't. They didn't support it, um, and so that's why a lot of a lot of people, including me, just left and ignored it. Uh, the church. And that'd be number one. Any politician who's representing everybody should call out these people. Um, and some some will hide behind a, uh, this conservative mantra. I don't have anything against conservatives unless they don't speak up for the right purpose. Yeah, well, they don't seem to be, you know, you were saying they should be labeled domestic terrorists, but they're yeah, always, that, that's... Conservatives, but, but the, the, the people, the uh, white supremacists. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, I'm not that, I'm not... I haven't finished the book. Just to be honest with everybody, but it starts uh, off with a, a you 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 know with a, a person coming to the plantation. This is way later in the sixties, um, uh, and you but you cover time from the, the sixteen the mid sixteen hundreds all the way to the nineteen sixties in your book. Why you, why go all the way back to the beginning there? What are you covering throughout those time periods? Well, I got to tell you that the first draft uh, was. Uh, read and critiqued heavily by some readers who said it's boring. We don't, <laughs> we, don't <laughs> we don't want to read. This happened in 1650, this in 1750, and so forth on up. That was boring. So I, I rewrote the first 75 pages, hmm. and I put in a narrator. And the narrator acts as a personal demonstration of what slavery was all about. My narrator is an ex-slave. Uh, people have asked me, well, who the heck is he? Because he lives for a long, long time. And he's actually a ghost. He's not a real person. But a family goes on a tour of the Sterling Plantation, and he takes them on a the tour. He shows them that he was given no shoes. He shows them the shack that his family lived in, that... Uh, was a dirt floor, sometimes mud when it rained or snowed. And by his physical body, his presence, he shows them just what it was like to be a slave. So that's the purpose of going all the way back because the, it just was horrible. But I wanted an actual figure in the book to demonstrate that. At one point, they, uh, the, there's a mother, a son, and a, and a husband and the son notices that uh, the narrator, Robert is his name, has uh, his shirt is torn on the back. And he looks through the tears and sees that these all of these scars are on Robert's back. And Robert says, yes, son. He said, when we didn't act right, we got whipped. We were lashed and treated poorly. It's, and it's a, it leaves the family in tears, just watching, because here's, a, here's a, a person in their midst demonstrating what it was like and what had happened to him. He had no shoes. He had poor clothes. And so you don't know what, you know, what, what to think of this, except that it was very bad. So that's why I went way back. I went way, way back also to look at the laws that the states passed to uh, keep the slaves down. Right. And let's yeah. talk about that in, in the 1960s, because you saw as the civil rights movement moved forward that Virginia, where you were, worked very hard at moving backwards. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. In, uh, and this is one of my pet peeves about history is that people, people think that the Brown versus Board of Education ruling, Supreme Court ruling in 1954, People say, oh, well, that integrated the schools. It did no such things. It said they should be, should be integrated, but it didn't. In Virginia, the state legislature passed over 200 laws to try to get around that ruling. And it wasn't until 1968 that a third Supreme Court ruling finally did away with what we know as those Jim Crow laws those Jim Crow laws that, that segregated the South 
and kept black people down. So in my, in my opinion, slavery did not end until 1968. And that, and yeah, I mean, and even, and even then it just kind of began to shift because today it's, we have a whole different version of it in the prison to profit system, but, right. Um, and we see, mm -hmm. we see uh, government doing similar things. Uh, do you see, and, and I mentioned, I referenced the Florida uh, legislature bowing to the NRA and then buckling back a little bit. We've seen other things, ice running around. Do you see a lot of parallels today? Um, with some scary times in the past, as far as moving towards this hatred, uh, like like Nazism, we, it, it, do, do you see us falling down into the same pit? Yeah, yeah. I, to me, it's tyranny, what's going on now. I mean, our, our chief of police here in, in Longmont has an agreement with ICE that they're not gonna come in and, and round up a whole bunch of immigrants, or illegal immigrants, what do you wanna call them? And he works with them to make sure that the innocent people in, in, his, in his city, and we have about 33,000 Latinos here. He works with them. We're not a sanctuary city, hmm. but our chief of police goes out and talks to these people. Every Sunday, he's walking their neighborhoods to get to know them and to assure them that they will be protected by the police. Yeah, because they're yeah. all afraid. They're all afraid. And they should be. ICE is a Gestapo, and they should be. It should be abolished. It's a. It's an abomination to this nation, and it's a disgrace uh, that they even exist. They're separating families, and it's horrific. I'm yep. surprised that Mike is working with them. I mean, more power to him. He's the one cop I know in a country that I actually respect, uh, and we've had him on his program. But uh, I, I didn't know he was working with them. They don't. They don't generally tend to follow any of their own laws. So that's surprising. Yeah. I'm glad he's on the streets. And what my what my father's referencing everybody is is the fact that for since 2015, for more than two years, Mike Butler and Dan Benavidez, along with many other people, have walked the streets. And this is community policing. This is police getting to know the community, and and it's done. Uh, it's it's part of a comprehensive um, uh, Longmont City plan. Uh, it's it's an amazing city. Uh, but uh, thank you, thank you for refer referencing that. It, it's uh, do. You, I just want to just one, one more thing on that. Do you do you feel outside of Longmont? Do you see racism inherent in um, law enforcement? Oh, well, you know, I, I went on Facebook, <laughs> and I'm not sure that was a good thing or not, uh, because <laughs> I reconnected with uh, a lot of old friends, old classmates, old friends from my from my uh, hometown back in Virginia. And I went on and I said, quite, quite frankly, I'm, I'm a liberal. I'm for human rights. I support human rights, which includes women, civil rights, blacks, uh, transgender, LGBT community, however you want to call it, anybody, uh, I support them. And I got a lot of crap, uh, <laughs> frankly. I said, you know, I'm not sure this is worth it. Um, one fellow, with, this is kind of funny, he says, uh, I don't know where Bill missed the turn, but I'm going to pray for him. <laughs> oh, gosh. I feel, I feel so much better. I know you yeah. do. I know you do, Dad. As much as you like thoughts and prayers, I know you feel better. Uh, oh. I, I want to bring in uh, uh, Laura Live and Good and Marcus. Do we have questions from the audience, you guys? Uh, we have one question coming from another German, from Dennis. Uh, he's one of, uh, of those guys who are volunteer here. And he's asking, out of your perspective as an accomplished elderly, elderly wise man, what would you suggest that we as a younger generation should do? Huh. Good question. I, I think the best thing you can do is to get to know your neighbors. Uh, get to know who they are. Uh, listen to them. Uh, my, my best advisor on this book was a black man. Uh, you could tell me a lot more about what it's like to be, uh, have racism, you know, and bigotry facing him every day. So if you don't know the people in your neighborhood, you don't know who, who your friends or your enemies are, I mean, you need to talk to them all. Uh, and that's what's right. missing in this country, is we are segregated. 
even though it's against the law, it is it's a cultural segregation, and that's that's not a very good thing. Um, you know, yeah. I, I, we in here in Longmont, we have a, a police chief who, do, who sets an example. He goes out and meets people, and he says, "You need to know your neighbors." He has 350 people in his public uh, public safety administration, 350 firemen and police, and he's putting them all on the streets. I can't think of something like that happening in uh, Baltimore. No, Cleveland. You know, other cities but it's that aspect of community that we've lost and 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 i want to tie into that and and then i want to show you something funny but uh <laughs> the, the, do you think that we can regain that community or a good portion of it just by practicing in our democracy i think it i think it happens one conversation at a time you know you don't you don't just break down all of these all of these racial uh, prejudices overnight. Um, it happens one one conversation at a time, and, I, and I'll tell you one that I had over over the internet. When I'm the only local commentator or, or opinion writer to the paper, who gives a an email reply address, and so I came on. I wrote a, a paper that was published on slavery. And I gave in about 500 words a history of slavery. And this guy writes back to me and says, you are a liberal idiot. And then he goes on to say, and also an asshole. Well, of course. <laughs> sorry, sorry to use a bad word. I know that I saw the <laughs> preliminary disclaimer. You're allowed to, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So... I had two choices, you know, with this guy. I could I could write back and I could just really tear him apart. I've been known to do that in writing. <laughs> I said, no, this guy lives in Longmont. He's got a point of view that's completely different from mine. So why don't I try something different? So I wrote back to him by email. I answer anybody who replies to me. And I said, you don't really know me. And I said, if you knew me, you'd know that I, I support human rights for everybody. And uh, I sent that off. And next day he wrote back and apologized. I would call that, and I have called it in the paper, a restorative conversation. It's one person who, uh, instead of being slammed by me, just like he slammed me, I reached out a different way. That's why you're my dad, full of wisdom, doing those things that I don't have the control to do. Be well, nice to people. It's a good <laughs> lesson, though. And, and you're right. He lives in your community. You, you, you two could be angry at each other, and 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 and, or or you could end up having a, a conversation that ends up building building community. You know, I go I go on Facebook and I and I not only see people praying for me, I see people <laughs> saying, "I've tried to educate liberals and it's just impossible." Oh, sounds like what Matt. Does it, what does it say when you read that? You know, what does it say? I it says, yeah. They've written off, written me off. With each of the two two segments in the political spectrum, liberal and conservative, can't talk to each other. So that's, why I'm, that's why I'm talking about know, know your neighbor. The next time you meet somebody that doesn't like your opinion, try a different way to talk to them. Well, and, and I think it ties back into what you were saying about your book, is that if you know somebody, you can't hate them. Yes. Right? That's, yeah, you know, I got this from, I met a uh, psychiatrist who wanted me to help him write his book. And uh, 93 years old, he was a psychiatrist who was famous for getting the Hillside Strangler to confess in oh. Los Angeles years ago. And he, he gave me a book by his wife, about his wife, and she, that was her uh, philosophy of life. That's how she provided therapy for people. And so it's just a, it's just a very different way to look, look at the situation. Um, 
common sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Laura, uh, Marcus, we got any final questions for Dad? Uh, I think we got another one. I don't know from uh, who raised the question. I don't find anywhere. But the question is, do you see any sign that eugenics is making a comeback in Virginia uh, or elsewhere? Did you say eugenics? Yes. Yes. It was not my question. I'm sorry. That was Al. That's Al Walski. Al Walski. Yes, that was Al. Yeah. That's uh, out, out of my... Bailey work. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, it, 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 but yeah. yeah they, I mean, there's there's been some interesting moves towards uh, cloning humans and chimps and stuff in China, but I don't know that I've seen any eugenics operations. Yes. Really. Okay. But, uh, Maybe it was referred to Virginia because you are from there, but I'm not aware that there's something going on like this. You know. All right. Okay. Yeah. But. Uh, I, but I like your approach when you, uh, with the be in the beginning of the interview when you said uh, that you sat down and uh, thought about uh, what would it be uh, being raised or being born into into a household in a mansion uh, as as a, as a as a white person, you know, and how would you uh, would you have developed, you know, in in your thinking of of black people, you know? I think this is very important because uh, for me as a German, it is the same question: what would have been my fate in the 1930s in Germany? What would have would have what would have been my living there? Would I have been also into into the the Nazi train, or would I would have been uh, resistant to this? You know, it, it is there. There are so many influences who, who make who make a human being in the end. You know, and this is I think it's a very interesting approach and a good approach. In my opinion. You know, I I doubt you would have a would have had a choice. Yes. Fergus. I think you would have been marched into a camp and given a uniform and told how to do sig heil and that was it. And if you we, didn't, we, if you didn't yeah. follow along, you would be punished. In, are, in general, you're absolutely right, yeah. We are you're in a country where you have freedom to do almost anything. Yeah. Very different from nineteen thirties. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I lived in uh, I lived in Germany for three years. Yes. I yes. love Germans. They're very friendly people. No sign of the thirties. You, know. you don't know Marcus. I don't know, Dad. They've changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's when I was there. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, and uh, I th I think it's it's a it must for you it must be for you a bitter ir irony you know that you are seeing now that you were there in Germany uh, after the the Second World War and you you have seen what what was going on in Germany you know you 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 maybe you you or you witnessed uh, former Gestapo agents or, or people like that you know and now to see what's going in America with ICE you know which are the same this the same structure of people you know as the Gestapo was you know it, it if, if I think it must drive you crazy somehow you know yeah it, it is it's frightening and there isn't is there doesn't seem to much be much uh, attention to the feelings of people yeah. um, they're frightening people and that some people like to do that yeah yeah, unfortunately, it's come around to that. I, I think education has a lot to do with that. Great questions. Thank you, Marcus, for adding your perspective into that. And that's, you know, I appreciate sure. that. Uh, Dad, we're going to get you out of here. Thank you for coming in and talking about your book. Uh, everybody can go to sterlingplantation.com, and you can order the book from Amazon, uh, and, and you can get it as a, a Kindle or a, a, a paperback. Is there anything else you'd like to, to tell everybody before we go? Oh, yeah. I just want to <laughs> uh, when I graduated from what, when I was still a senior in high school, I uh, played my last football game. And the, the next morning, uh, we went over to see the black high school play a football game. Uh, and it's a scene I'll never forget. Uh, the black high school was wearing the same uniforms we had worn at the white high school, but they were worn out. So we handed down that was that was what their uniforms were i was in the band at the white high school and at halftime i saw the black high school band marching with uh, our old uniforms the ones that had worn out i think what i'm telling you is that that was separate but equal education in the south that's what it meant 
you got hand-me-downs, you got old textbooks if you got textbooks. Uh, it was a shame, and we treated people just awful. And and so I, I've always remembered that story as to as that scene, as to seeing that, and just uh, uh, really an eye-opener to me as to what segregation meant. And of course, the worst thing it meant was that we didn't know each other. Okay? We were separated. We couldn't know each other. Right, right. And... and uh... Yeah, I remember you telling me that story, and and uh, you you've said we'll just wrap it around to the to today. You've said before that you see charter schools uh, as the same concept as segregation, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm against them. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Dad. Thank you for coming to talk about your book. Um, Thank you for letting me do it. Absolutely, absolutely. Nice meeting you too. <laughs> thank you. Pleasure meeting you too, sir. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for, for being on the show. Awesome. Great, great to have you. All right, Appreciate all right. It. You can get out of here, Dad. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's my dad, everybody. And yes, Density McCartney, you are absolutely right. I am very lucky to have a dad like my dad. <laughs>